This is an interview with Mrs. Ali, Mrs. Margaret Ali, who is the wife of Mr. Zaman Ali. Um, the date is the 22nd of October, 1996. Okay, Mrs. Ali, if you could tell me uh, where you were born um, and the date of, and your date of birth. Uh, my date of birth is 9-12-22, and I was born in Macduff in Bampshire, Scotland, yes. Um, and if we could start by uh, you telling me a little bit about Mr Ali. Um, when did he arrive in Britain and, and where, did he, where did he go first? Well, uh, as far as I know, he arrived in Britain sometime about 1934. Well, I've got, you know, like I've got proof of that, but uh, it might have been before that, because that's when he did these films and uh, he got he worked in London as a, a, a peddler and uh, he went around a uh, people's store you know selling uh, clothing and that and uh, he uh, he did that job in the um, he stayed there a good few years and then he came uh, up to Birmingham and he uh, opened a warehouse for selling uh, clothes to the other people, the peddlers, for, for them to sell. And in these days there was only about two two or three of these warehouses. But of course today there's hundreds. <laughs> yes, but um, then um, it wasn't until 1946 when I met him at uh, a party at somebody's house. And uh, that was when we got acquainted. Let me ask you, um, why did he decide to move to, to migrate from Mirpur to England? Well, I think everybody has got a dream of coming to another uh, country. And that was more or less uh, what they did. Because there weren't that many, uh, well, any kind of... Uh, um, Pakistani, well, in that day, it was India. There wasn't many Indians over here in that uh, time. What did he do when he was in Mirpur? Well, um, he had a camel, and he used to go to different villages and uh, uh, maybe uh, take him wood or things like that, you know, the... With the camels, they well, they uh, got that kind of work for carrying heavy things. Mm -hmm. And how how did he feel about the future in Mirpur? Well, at that time, it wasn't very good because uh, there was no schools for children, and uh, it was just. Uh, they worked on the farms and uh, it wasn't all that uh, good for them over there. That's why they always wanted at least one of the sons to go to a different country so that uh, if they go to work, they can uh, get their wages and send so much to keep them, yes. So were, were other members of his family or perhaps his friends coming over? Did he come over alone or...? He came over alone. He went to Bombay and uh, he had a relation that was a uh, Sering, you know, that's the head man. And uh, they picked a date, give them a job on the ship, yes. 
So he planned to come to England. His t why did he? Do you know why he chose to come to England? I don't know. And where did his ship sail to? Oh, he sailed sailed to different parts of the world, and then uh, it came to England. And uh, I think it was uh, Glasgow where he um, they stopped at. And he went out to have a look of what, you know, the town and that. And um, he missed the ship. <laughs> so after his ship had gone, he uh, made his way to London. So he would have got back on the ship and gone somewhere else? He would have done, yes. Whether he would have uh, carried on being a seaman, you don't know. But uh, he managed to find his way to London and there was this uh, two brothers. Uh, they gave him a, a, got him a licence and that for being a peddler, you see. And uh, these two brothers, they were from Lahore in the further south. It doesn't come in... Kashmir it comes from uh, Pakistan and uh, they had they were the ones one of the brothers was one for the pick the films and uh, he worked with Alexandra Corda the big film producer and uh, when they wanted uh, ec extras they were called then uh, they uh, picked, because by the, uh, that time there was a little bit more uh, Kashmiris had come into the England. And uh, then they made the four feathers, the drum, Sabu, and uh, the Thief of Baghdad. And one of the brothers acted in this, was an extra in this film? There were, uh, uh, no, they, uh, one of the brothers, they helped to make a film and they uh, brought in the people, yes. So do you know where he lived in London? What kind of accommodation he lived in? Well, uh, to start off with, I think he lived with these... Uh, near where these brothers were, because they had a shop, you see, and uh, I think he lived with uh, either, he lived with them or somewhere, you know, I'm not quite sure about that. And he obviously, he wouldn't have spoken any English at this time, did no. he? No, no, he didn't know much English. I don't think he did know any English at that time. OK, and when when did he move to Birmingham and why? Well, I think he just wanted to change. I never don't really know why he moved up here. I think it was just maybe he wanted a change of scenery and then this is where uh, he more or less started his own business, but with the help of uh, one of the brothers. Mm. So did he know anybody in Birmingham before he came? Uh, he might have known one or two. There wasn't many when he came up here. But he, he would have, I expect, he would have known some of them up here. Mm. And do you know where he lived when he first came here? Would that be in a, a house with some, some friends? Oh, yes. So Mr Ali um, opened a draper's shop. Was this after a, after he'd been here a while? or? No, well, maybe a couple of weeks or a month or so after he came. Because he moved up to... Not far from here. Uh, 110 Pershaw Road, you see, and uh, it was a big house and they had a 
you know, the big back room. So he opened that up as a warehouse, you see, and uh, that is where he did his business until um, 52, 50, aye, 51 or 52, when uh, he, we moved from there down to Borsalith Road and we had a shop then, you see, and uh, we lived up above there. Mm -hmm. Did he do any community work at this time? Oh yes, uh, all to do with uh, through the mosque. You see, he was what they called uh, the welfare officer and uh, he helped uh, all the people, you know. Like, if they had any troubles in that, like with some bad neighbours or the husband and the wife had a fight, you know, and that, then they would come to him to see what he could get done about it. Mm. And had the mosque been built at this time? No. No, we had the mosque in a house in Speedwell Road. And uh, especially during Eid, uh, the, when the Eid festival came on, we used to give a children's party. And uh, of course the mothers and fathers and that was there. And uh, they were all, uh, dumb, you know, uh, Bengali, uh, uh, Kashmiris, Pakistanis and uh, uh, people from uh, some of the Arab countries as well, because that was the only mosque that was in the, in uh, Birmingham. Until oh, until about uh, forty eight, forty nine, something like that, and then the the Arabs made themselves a mosque in Edward Road. And uh, my husband got them to uh, to for burials the cemeteries, part of Lodge Hill, and uh, since then another couple Brandon, Brandon would end in that places for the burials, but uh, after um, sixty two I think it was. Uh, when the aeroplanes, when you could get a flight on PIA, the Pakistan International Airlines, then uh, they used to send the bodies back home for burial. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me about, you said you met Mr. Mr. Ali at um, a party in, was it 1947? 46. 46. In 46. Uh, it was a party they... It was say, some relation. I can't remember if he was a nephew or an uncle. But he'd gone missing after the, during the war because he was in the army for uh, fighting with the British. And uh, he, was, he went missing. And it, the, it took him about three years I think it was after the war when they found him. And uh, they had been given uh, a little party. Well, some of his friends worked in the same factory as I did, Hercules. And uh, they asked if I would come and help, you know, for making tea and things like that, making sandwiches and that. So I says, all right, I will. And um, that is where I met him. And then a year after that, uh, 40, 1947, we got married in both uh, their religion and uh, English. But we got married at uh, uh, East London Mosque. And the um, registrar 
came down to the mosque to marry us. Mm -hmm. Can you remember what your first impressions were of your, your, your husband? Do you remember the part he had? Yes. Had you heard of him? Did you know what, what he did? Not really, no. I didn't really know when... Uh, it wasn't until afterwards that I found out uh, what he was um, a bit like, you know. Mm -hmm. And what was Herc Hercules? That was a... a Munition factory. Right. Because I came down to England in 1941 when I was only about 17, 18. And uh, I worked at uh, Hercules uh, first in Aston Cross and then at Manor Mills in Nichols. Mm -hmm. Can you remember what the reaction was of, of family and friends when, when you both when you got married? Yeah. Well, uh, my family at first wasn't too keen. But um, I think after that, they came round because my father worked on the railway so he could get a pass any time. And uh, they wrote and they said they would like to come down. So as I says to my husband, I says, well, it's best to say yes and then they can come down and then that's up to them whether they want to know us or not. And they came down and uh, I got some other friends. Um, he came from Jalundri, that was further down Pakistan, and his wife, um, Rose. So we had a... Uh, Nice uh, dinner and everything like that, and uh, they seem to uh, get on with them very well. So uh, they went back up, back up to Scotland, very happy that um, I was all right, and uh, they got nothing to worry about. And of course, we've he's been up to Aberdeen and uh, for holidays. And uh, we've all been very friendly, you know. I mean, they've been down, I've been up there, and everything with my parents and my family has been all right, yes. Right, and you were accepted in, with, among his friends, and were there any of his family members over here at the time? Well, by that time, there was uh, quite a few that came over. And um, you've got the same with them as what you've got with our own people. You know, you've got uh, ones that doesn't want to, their relations to marry English, you know, and so on like that. But um, after a while, they, they, we got on all right. Oh yeah, we got on all right, yes. Mm. Um, did you adopt any aspects of the Islamic religion? Yes, because as I thought, as, when I had my son, as I said, it's no good uh, fighting over which religion. And uh, I says, well, he can be brought up in your religion and then when he's old enough, that's up to him to choose. But of course, he's still Muslim. And uh, so am I. Because, well, the, uh, you cannot eat uh, bacon or anything like that. You see, so uh, during the war, before then, uh, you had your bacon and ham and that, but it's only since the war that uh, pork and everything like this has came more 
popular. Well, you see, these things, I've never tasted, so it's never bothers me, you see. And uh, there's plenty of their shops where you can go and get uh, chicken meat or whatever you want. So, you see, it's, uh, no, it's not uh, a problem. Did you mm. have um, a ceremony to become Muslim? Do, do you have to go through some kind of ceremony that... No, that was done uh, when we got married, because we were married in both the Muslim faith and English, because that was uh, according to the the law, and it is still the law. Uh, you must get married in English first, and then you can get married in uh, Muslim. But you can, it's not recognised if you are married in Muslim, you see. You've got to get married uh, uh, at the register office. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a Muslim wedding in the, what yes. you wore and what you ate and... Yes. Uh -huh. Quite traditional in that way, you'd yes. say. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So you, you had a son in 1957? Yes. Yes, I had a son, uh, Abdul Kali, he's called in uh, 1957. And what does, what does um, Abdul Khalik do now? Well, now he's a partner in an estate business. They buy and sell uh, houses. And uh, he's uh, doing very well. And uh, of course now he lives down in at Northampton. He's got a lovely house there. And um He didn't have any problem adjusting to the fact well, I mean he would have to adjust, but he the fact that his parents are from different cultural backgrounds that No. He didn't have any problems with his identity or No. 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 Because he was never... brought up as a Muslim. Yes. Yes. Yes, he was, and um, he made plenty, quite a few friends, because some he still got today, some of the friends, yes. And uh, they never seemed to bother whether what you were, you know. And uh -huh. is he married now? Yes. Is his wife... Um, English. English. Yes. She's, um, she works for a pharmaceutical firm and uh, she's uh, just been promoted a bit higher up and, uh, oh, she's lovely. She looks after me very well, yes. And her parents as well, you know. Because the last year we was up there for Christmas to her parents and uh, we all get on very well, yes. They wanted to see the owner of the house and when uh, he went out to see them they asked him about uh, what's all these men doing here and uh, when uh, he t told them it was a party going on they wouldn't take much notice anyway there was uh, some friends of ours uh, in the police in the party because we had um, the Lord Mayor and he went out to see them and he says, can't you see the car, that car out there? Do you know whose it is? And the police says, no. He says, well, go and have a good look. He says, that's the Lord Mayor's car. He says, we're all having, a, you know, a big party. Yes, and of course the police just went away and that was it finished. <laughs> and after that, as many parties we've had since then, uh, nobody's but to query it at all. <coughs> <coughs> mm. So, 
with her. We've had some very good parties there and <coughs> they got more famous as the years went round. So you went to Mirpur in 1960? 60, December, December 61. Mm. And you went, you took a petition? You were doing a petition to help some Kashmiris? Oh yes, uh, we did a petition. At, uh, before we went, we got in touch with the High Commission in London. And uh, between them and the British Home Office, they worked out we would be allowed to take 500 people. Well, we didn't uh, get that many because some didn't want to come into England before uh, the clamp down because in 62 it stopped a lot uh, a lot of people coming into England and uh, you had to get uh, sponsors and everything after that so we had uh, uh, all these people that came to our house in the Morak and Yal and I had to fill in all the forms and everything like that and my hands oh they were all swelled up and everything and then um, they applied to the uh, government in Ralpindi for passports and uh, we paid for everything you know it was only a fee but uh, it did doing a lot of passports it did take a bit more money you know but we paid for all that and then uh, a lot of them that uh, once they got the money to pay for the fare then they came to England and uh, because they at that time they only came by themselves but after that they started bringing their uh, wives over you see but they always had to have um, they always had to have a sponsor over here somebody either a relation or somebody to uh, keep them until they got a job and find them a job because uh, a lot of them at that time didn't go on to the um, social, you see. And it wasn't until after they'd uh, been working in that. And of course, nowadays, they all do it because other people does it, you see. But um, well, uh, we got on very well. We everybody there and... Uh, the way you see them, uh, all the family in the fields, cutting the hay and things like that, you know. And uh, after, when they've got it all thing made up, they have a kind of a little feast. And uh, it's like uh, over here, when you the end of the harvest, mm -hmm. you have a harvest festival between yourselves. And... Uh, the uh, everybody's got a couple of nanny goats, a buffalo for milk, and uh, then uh, uh, if you wanted sugar, most people had the what you call the Pakistani sugar, but uh, with me being there, I got the. English sugar because they grow sugar as well, sugar beet and uh, they make uh, the white sugar for all the foreigners that comes into Pakistan and uh, the other sugar for the people that lives in the villages yes uh -huh. and Mr. Ali, he also raised money for things like the dispensaries? Yes, 
Yes, he raised there for six dispensaries and uh, they used to go to, there was one given to each big, uh, like Merpur is a big town, but it is about a, as big as a city or something now. And uh, all over like that into these, you know, the country places. And they used to go round there to see how the people is. If anybody was sick or injured, they uh, treated them there. And uh, there was always a doctor with them and some nurses. And uh, if they had to be taken to hospital, well, they took them into the hospital, yes. So they were like mobile doctor's vans? Yes, yes, mobile. Mm -hmm. Because they've got uh, the van and the doors open and then they've got another, like a tent, the covered, the entrance, so that people could go in private and uh, the doctors would see them. It wasn't on a full view of everybody waiting outside. Was this in the 1960s that he...? Yes. Yes, around about uh, 90... Uh, before, yes, 1960s. Because when we went in 62, we see the, the vans there. Yes. It so must have been about 1960 when uh, that was done. Mm -hmm. And he also raised money for a, a Pakistani student to go home? Yes. His uh, mother had taken very ill and uh, he wanted to go home and the High Commission notified Mr Ali and he collected the money and uh, the body stick it and told him uh, that uh, he could go home to see his mother. Yes. And how how do you think Mr. Ali is remembered today? Is he still remembered? Oh, he's still remembered. Yes, yes. Uh, somebody told me that uh, that said prayers in that for him in the mosque, and uh, I couldn't get in touch with this man that uh, well when he was in uh, Pakistan last last year I think it was uh, they had r written a story up about him and uh, I seen the paper but I had to give it back to him because it belonged to somebody else and uh, I've uh, I haven't seen him to ask him about a copy, you know. Mm. And as far as I know, some of it was like this. And uh, how they remember him and uh, the things that he had done for Pakistan, well, for Pakistan and Kashmir. And that, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, he still remembered. And sometimes when I may be uptown somewhere and as sure as anything, somebody will come over. Hello, Margaret. It's a long, long, long time since we've seen you. And uh, they still remember us and uh, they talk about the man, you know, and that. And it's very, it's very nice when somebody will come up and... Uh, mention about someone, you know, that uh, they still think of him, yes. Like certainly he had his enemies, the same as everybody else, but uh, most of them do think they remember him. Mm -hmm. And so Mr. Mr. Riley, he came to regard Birmingham as his home? Yes, yes. He was very happy living? Oh yes, he, he was. He didn't want to go back ever to live in Mirpur? I don't think so, because like uh, 
now there's not all that many people left in Merpur. Because, uh, especially in his village, because they're all over here, you see. So, uh, he did like to go back every so often, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and how did he? What did he think of the changes that happened in Mirpur with the with the dam being built? Well, it uh, it well it brought uh, more or less uh, they built a road and that, and then uh, they started having buses and everything. You see, it wasn't. Um, uh, it wasn't quite uh, if you wanted to go somewhere you had to have a horse and you could go like that and um, or you had to walk now we went from Morakinyal to uh, up country can't remember uh, we was going to some other villages and they says to me get on the horse you know and I've never been on a horse in my life and uh, anyway I got up oh, and I felt so high up you know and then we there was a big ravine and the horse was going and I'm scared stiff, I says, I can't get, you know, what am I going to do if I fall down there? And they says, oh no, the horse wouldn't do that. He's so sure-footed. And I says, no, I says, I'll have to get off. So here's me walking behind the horses and uh, the, the men in front with the horses. And that's how it was, you see. And then, but uh, now, They've got more roads and everything and buses, you see, because uh, there is a lot of people uh, goes home every so often. And then now with the father, he's getting on and uh, they've started with taxi business, you know, and uh, all these kind of things, you see, so that uh, now there is more um, more people has got better jobs and they've got better money you see uh, but uh, uh, when they tried to go back after Bhutu to uh, being very religious and uh, I think that was during uh, uh, the presidency of Zia. And then after he died, and uh, he came back to Batu and them, then uh, it started getting uh, back to what it was, you know, instead of being so strict on this, that, and the next thing. And uh, uh, because a lot of the other Arab countries, as you find out now, they're all going backwards, mm. you see. Well, uh, there is some people that in Pakistan is backward, backwards in that sense, and other ones wants to move forward, you see. But you've always got that sect of people that would rather be a hundred years behind than a hundred years in front. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you went, you went to, did you go back to Mirpur again after 1961? Oh yes, well, um, we went to, we buried my husband in, Pak in uh, Kashmir in uh, 83. And uh, the government paid everything for us to go. And when we are 
reached Rapindi, there was a very big thunderstorm and we were taken down to Karachi and we stayed there in the airport uh, for a good few hours and then when the storm had f finished we went up and uh, we went through Merpur and uh, came along the bridge over the dam to uh, Morek and Yal and uh, he was buried uh, the next day and uh, we went to, into, well we had to go into Merpur if we went anywhere and uh, it was a lot better in the old Merpur because the um, the houses was all built uh, of stone in that and uh, it was a uh, more um, more modern to what it used to be. They had electricity and, and El electricity sanitary. and uh, toilets, yes. And some houses they had bathrooms or not bathrooms, showers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because just before uh, we left uh, Merpe, not Merpur, Morik and Yal, uh, they started putting an electric light in there and to toilets, you see, and uh, getting running water, where they used to go sometimes in the mid middle of the village we these caskets like big jugs and uh, they used to put it on their heads to carry them and that very very heavy you know yes but now uh, they've got run hot, uh, running water and everything now yes uh-huh Mm. They're a bit more civilised. Um, can you tell me something about the work you did with the um, the, a, a, uh, the the UK Asian Women's Association? Oh yes. Or the U? What is it? The UK Pakistan. The, Pakis the Pakistan Women's Association. Mm. Yes. Um, they used to try and help people when they first started. They used to try and help people. And uh, if they had any troubles <coughs> or uh, to do with their children and uh, if they were sick or anything, you know, and uh, then we used to uh, get uh, some money for charity because we've gave uh, children in need Twice we've gave them quite a bit of money and then we've uh, sent money also to uh, the blind in places like that, the hospitals in Pakistan and uh, then uh, at the uh, it's a lot of the uh, but we call saints that has died. When their birthdays or that comes on, we have uh, we kind of uh, cut, cut them where we go in the mosque and uh, sit and they read. Uh, they've got so many small books of the Quran and I think you have about 14 or 15 and that makes one Quran and um, you've got to read so many of these and then afterwards they uh, sing uh, songs to do with the religion you know more like how we would sing a hymn they sing like this and uh, then they have more prayers and then uh, after it finishes 
We have something to eat. Yes. And the women, the women's association was set up when? Oh, uh, I think in '68. Right. And what was your role? Treasurer. And I have been. I'm still treasurer. Mm. And uh, we have. Uh, we see to all the festivals. And. Uh, when Eid comes, you know, for Ramadan, and then Eid, and then uh, we keep up all these things. And uh, we have some children's parties. It's based in Birmingham then? Yes. Right. Yes, this one's based in Birmingham, yes. Do you have contacts with similar groups yes. around the country? Yes, because... Uh, they uh, the big one is in London at the High Commission because the High Commission Commissioner's wife is um, to do with it she's ahead one over it as uh, Every time they get a new High Commissioner, then uh, they take over, yes. But it was uh, first thought about by um, Begum Ali Khan, the wife of uh, Riyakit Ali Khan. And uh, yeah, I think he was the president, the first president or something of Pakistan uh, and um, it was through the Begum that uh, this uh, got started it started first in London and then different areas uh, like Birmingham, Bradford and so on like that where uh, they have a lot of the the women, mm -hmm. and of course the uh, all types of women, they can be poor, you know, uh, or up to the wealthiest. Everybody's accepted into there. Yes. What changes have you seen in the Mirpuri community in Birmingham um, since you met your husband, you know, in the last 50 years? Do you think, oh. Okay, what changes have you seen in the Mirpuri community in the last 50 years? Well, I haven't really seen... Just mostly with the Merpuri people here, they, especially the women, they're getting a better standard of living. And uh, they are, um, some people is able to go to work, which they couldn't do before. And um, they are, uh, they're not just stuck to the house now. They're able to go out and shop and do the same things as everybody else. And um, I think they get on very well now. Mm.